old friends, good people. Did they know you were smoking pot allegedly on the roof of the White House? <laughs> I forgot to tell you. <laughs> Willie Nelson became a major figure in the outlaw country music movement, which started in the late 1960s as a response to the more traditional and conservative Nashville sound. Willie's album Shotgun Willie, 1973, was a critical success, and it, along with the success of Red-Headed Stranger, 1975, and Stardust, 1978, helped cement his status as one of the most recognized artists in country music. Throughout his career, Willie has made strong connections within the country music world, including with Chris Christopherson, another country legend. Chris embraced the outlaw persona in the 1970s, which helped Willie create Austin as a hub for country artists who didn't fit into the clean-cut mainstream Nashville style. Chris was part of the 1972 Dripping Springs reunion, a wild party that later inspired Willie's annual 4th of July picnic. He played at Willie's first picnic the following year and remained involved with the event for decades, performing at 16 of these picnics, with the last one being in Austin in 2016. However, recently, Willie shared some surprising news about Chris Christopherson's life, which has left fans with questions and concerns about whether everything is going well. Stay tuned to learn about the latest details surrounding Willie and Chris's friendship. Early Life Willie Nelson was born on April 29, 1933, in Abbott, Texas, to Ira Doyle Nelson and Merle Marie, nay Greenhaw. Interestingly, his birth date was mistakenly recorded by Dr. F. D. Sims as April 30th. His cousin Mildred gave him the name Willie and chose Hugh as his middle name to honor her younger brother who had recently passed away. Willie can trace his family history back to the American Revolutionary War, where one of his ancestors, John Nelson, served as a major. In 1929, before Willie was born, his parents moved from Arkansas to Texas in search of work. His grandfather, William, was a blacksmith, and his father worked as a mechanic. Soon after Willie was born, his mother left, and his father later remarried and moved away as well. This left Willie and his sister, Bobby, to be raised by their grandparents. His grandparents, who had taught singing back in Arkansas, introduced both children to music. When Willie was six years old, his grandfather bought him a guitar and taught him a few chords. Willie and Bobby would sing gospel songs together at their local church. By age seven, Willie had already written his first song, and at nine, he started playing guitar in a local band called Bohemian Polka. During the summers, his family would pick cotton with other locals from Abbott. Willie, however, didn't enjoy picking cotton, so he started earning money by singing in dance halls, taverns, and honky-tonks by the time he was 13. He continued performing through his high school years. His musical influences included Jimmy Rogers, Hank Williams, Bob Wills, Lefty Frizzell, Ray Price, Ernest Tubb, Hank Snow, Django Reinhardt, Frank Sinatra, and Louis Armstrong. While attending Abbott High School, Willie was an active student playing on the football, basketball, and baseball teams. He also raised pigs as part of the Future Farmers of America. Even while still in school, Willie played guitar and sang in a band called The Texans, which was formed by his sister's husband, Bud Fletcher. They performed in Honky Tonks and had a Sunday morning radio spot at KHBR in Hillsboro, Texas. Around this time, Willie worked various jobs, including as a relief phone operator in Abbott, a tree trimmer for the local electric company, and a pawn shop employee. In 1950, after finishing high school, Willie joined the U.S. Air Force. Unfortunately, he was discharged after nine months due to back problems. After returning in 1952, he married Martha Matthews. From 1954 to 1956, he studied agriculture at Baylor University, where he was a member of the Tau Kappa Epsilon fraternity. However, he left school to fully focus on his music career. Willie worked many different jobs to support himself, including as a nightclub bouncer, auto parts salesman, saddle maker, and tree trimmer. He also became part of Johnny Bush's band during this time. Willie and his family later moved to Pleasanton, Texas. There, he auditioned for a DJ position at K-Bop, despite having no radio experience. The station's owner, Dr. Ben Parker, gave Willie the job, and it was at K-Bop that Willie made his first two recordings in 1955, The Storm Has Just Begun, and When I've Sung My Last Hillbilly Song. 
He used the station's equipment to record on used tapes and sent his demos to a local label, Sarg Records, which unfortunately rejected them. After K-Bop, Willie worked for other radio stations like KDNT in Denton and KCUL and KCNC in Fort Worth, where he hosted a show called The Western Express. He also taught Sunday school and played in nightclubs at the same time. After some time, Willie decided to try his luck in San Diego, but couldn't find work there, so he hitchhiked to Portland, Oregon, where his mother was living. When no one picked him up, he ended up spending the night sleeping in a ditch before hopping onto a freight train headed to Eugene. Eventually, a truck driver helped him out by giving him a ride to a bus station and lending him $10 for a ticket to reach Portland. Career Willie Nelson's career took a big turn when he was hired by KVN in Vancouver, Washington. He became a familiar face on a local TV show and, in 1956, recorded his first single, No Place For Me, with Lumberjack by Leon Payne on the B-side. Unfortunately, this record didn't gain much attention. While working as a radio announcer, he also performed in Vancouver clubs, but his music wasn't taking off the way he had hoped. He briefly moved to Colorado, where he performed in nightclubs, but things didn't improve. After trying to get a spot on Ozark Jubilee and failing, Willie ended up working as a dishwasher. This job didn't make him happy, so he returned to Texas, first spending some time in Waco before finally settling in Fort Worth. For about a year, Willie stepped away from the music scene completely. During this break, he sold Bibles and vacuum cleaners door to door, and eventually worked his way up to becoming a sales manager for the encyclopedia. Americana. In 1958, after his son Billy was born, Willie and his family moved to Houston, Texas. On the way there, he stopped by the Esquire Ballroom, hoping to sell some of his original songs to the house band singer, Larry Butler. Butler didn't buy the song Mr. Record Man for the $10 Willie had asked for, but instead loaned him $50 to help Willie rent an apartment. Along with this loan, Butler offered Willie a six-night gig singing at the club. Willie soon settled into his apartment in Pasadena, Texas, and got a job as the morning DJ at a radio station. He also recorded a couple of singles during this time, including Man with the Blues and What a Way to Live. Around this time, Willie was hired by Paul Buskirk, a guitar instructor, to work as a music teacher at his school. Willie sold one of his songs, Family Bible, to Buskirk for $50. This song became a big hit for singer Claude Gray in 1960. Another song, Nightlife, was sold for $150 and also went on to be quite successful. In 1960, Willie made a big move to Nashville, Tennessee, hoping to find more success in the heart of country music. He had a hard time getting a label to sign him, so he spent a lot of his time at Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, a bar near the Grand Ole Opry where many famous singers and songwriters hung out. It was there that Willie met Hank Cochran, a songwriter who worked for Pamper Music, a publishing company owned by Ray Price and Hal Smith. Cochran liked what he heard from Willie during a jam session and convinced his boss, Smith, to use Cochran's raise to pay Willie $50 a week to sign him to the company. Farron Young, a popular country artist at the time, heard Willie sing Hello Walls at Tootsie's and decided to record it. Ray Price also recorded Willie's song, Nightlife. At this point, Willie's song started to gain attention from other artists, with hits like Funny How Time Slips Away by Billy Walker, Pretty Paper by Roy Orbison, and the most famous of all, Crazy by Patsy Cline. In 1961, Willie signed with Liberty Records and started recording at Bradley Studios in Nashville. His first successful singles were released the next year, including Willingly, a duet with Shirley Colley, who would later become his second wife. The song became his first top 10 hit, reaching number 10 on the charts. His second hit, Touch Me, climbed to number seven. These singles were part of his first album, And Then I Wrote, which came out in 1962. Willie and Shirley got married in Las Vegas in 1963. At this time, Willie was also working for Pampa Records on the West Coast, but the job didn't leave him enough time to play his own music, so he eventually left and bought a ranch in Ridgetop, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. In early 1964, Willie was signed to Monument Records by Fred Foster, but only one single, I Never Cared For You, was released. By the fall of that same year, 
Willie moved to RCA Victor, signing a $10,000 per year contract thanks to Chet Atkins. His first album under this label was Country Willie, His Own Songs, recorded in April 1965. During that year, Willie joined the Grand Ole Opry and became friends with Waylon Jennings after seeing one of Waylon's shows in Phoenix, Arizona. In 1967, he formed his own backing band, The Record Men, featuring Johnny Bush, Jimmy Day, Paul English, and David Zetner. Although Willie's early years with RCA Victor didn't produce major hits, some of his singles did reach the top 25, such as One in a Row in 1966 and The Party's Over in 1967. By the early 1970s, Willie's career wasn't where he wanted it to be. Most of the money he was making from his songwriting was being poured into tours that weren't bringing in much profit. His personal life also hit a rough patch when he and Shirley Colley divorced in 1970. That December, his ranch in Tennessee burned down and Willie saw it as a sign that things needed to change. He moved to a new ranch in Bandera, Texas and married Connie Kepke. In 1971, his single, I'm a Memory, made it into the top 30. After recording his last single for RCA in 1972, Willie was frustrated with the lack of success his albums were having and decided to step away from music, even though his contract wasn't up. After relocating to Austin, Texas, Willie Nelson found a resurgence in his career, influenced by the growing hippie music scene, which embraced his blend of country, folk, and jazz. The change in atmosphere led to a surge in his popularity as he performed across the city. In March, he took the stage at the Dripping Springs Reunion, a country music festival that, although unsuccessful in drawing the anticipated crowd, sparked the idea for Nelson's future 4th of July picnic, a yearly event he launched the following year. Motivated by his growing success and reinvigorated passion for music, Nelson re-entered the recording business and brought Neil Reshin on as his manager. Reshin successfully negotiated Nelson's release from his RCA contract by paying $14,000 in dues. Soon after, Nelson became Atlantic Records' first country artist, signing a deal that paid him $25,000 annually. In 1973, Nelson recorded Shotgun Willie, an album that marked a departure from his previous style. Although the record didn't sell well initially, it received critical acclaim, and Nelson later referred to it as a moment of artistic liberation. His next album, Phases and Stages, released in 1974, was a concept album about the dissolution of a marriage, drawing from his personal experiences. The success of these albums laid the foundation for his contract with Columbia Records, where Nelson negotiated full creative control. This newfound artistic freedom led to the release of Red-Headed Stranger in 1975, a minimalist concept album that included the chart-topping hit Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, Nelson's first number one single. At this point, Nelson, along with Waylon Jennings, was solidifying his reputation within the burgeoning outlaw country movement, a genre that stood in stark contrast to the polished Nashville sound of the time. Their collaboration on the album Wanted the Outlaws, 1976, became a landmark achievement in country music, as it was the first album in the genre to go platinum. Nelson followed this up with further success in the form of The Sound in Your Mind and his first gospel album, Troublemaker. However, Nelson's success wasn't without complications. In 1977, he discovered that Rachen, his manager, had failed to pay taxes to the IRS. This issue, compounded by a drug-related scandal involving a package sent from Reshin's office to Jennings, led to Reshin's dismissal. Mark Rothbaum, Reshin's assistant who took the fall for the drug charge, impressed Nelson with his loyalty and was hired as his new manager. In 1978, Nelson released two more platinum albums, Waylon and Willie, which included the hit Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up To Be Cowboys and Stardust an album of pop standards that many feared would ruin his career, but instead became a massive success. His string of hits continued into the late 70s with tracks like Good Hearted Woman and If You've Got the Money, I've Got the Time. The 1980s saw Nelson continue his rise to superstardom with iconic songs like On the Road Again, a track from the movie Honeysuckle Rose, and his duet with Julio Iglesias to All the Girls I've Loved Before. 
In 1982, he teamed up with Merle Haggard for the critically acclaimed album Poncho and Lefty, and during those sessions, he recorded Always On My Mind, a song that would become a massive hit. Nelson's career reached new heights with the song, earning him three Grammy Awards in 1983 and solidifying the song as one of his most beloved. Nelson also became part of the supergroup The Highwaymen, alongside Waylon Jennings, Johnny Cash, and Chris Christopherson, achieving both critical and commercial success. Throughout this period, Nelson became involved in a variety of charitable endeavors, including participating in the We Are The World project in 1984. Despite his fame, he maintained his laid-back rebellious image, which included a now-famous incident where he reportedly smoked marijuana on the roof of the White House during a visit in the late 1970s. Nelson's journey through the 1990s and 2000s reflected his continuous dedication to music and philanthropy. In 1996, he revisited some of his earlier work by re-recording Hello Walls and Bloody Mary Morning with rock bands for Twisted Willie, a tribute album with proceeds going to Farm Aid, a cause close to Nelson's heart. This period also saw Nelson collaborating with a diverse range of artists, such as Johnny Cash, Chris Christopherson, and even grunge and punk musicians, showing his ability to bridge different genres and eras. As the years progressed, Nelson stayed on the road, releasing critically acclaimed albums like Teatro in 1998, and joining forces with notable acts like Fish, Johnny Cash, and Toby Keith. His duet with Keith, Beer From My Horses, became a major hit, sitting at the top of the country charts for six consecutive weeks in 2003. During the same period, Nelson participated in a special tribute album that won the 2004 Grammy Award for Best Reggae Album, showcasing his ability to cross over into different musical landscapes. In 2005, he also delved into reggae himself with the release of Countrymen, continuing to expand his artistic range. His involvement in charity remained strong, headlining benefit concerts, such as one in response to the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake, which raised funds for UNICEF. Collaborations with jazz artists, including trumpeter Wynton Marsalis, brought new dimensions to his music. Their performance at Lincoln Center in 2007 led to the release of the live album Two Men with the Blues in 2008. In the 2010 S, Nelson's momentum didn't slow down. He signed a new deal with Legacy Recordings and released Heroes in 2012, featuring collaborations with artists like his sons Lucas and Micah, Snoop Dogg, and Chris Christopherson. The album received positive reviews and performed well on the charts. His 2013 album, To All the Girls, a collection of duets with female artists such as Dolly Parton and Loretta Lynn, was another hit, marking his continued presence in the music scene. In 2014, Nelson's band of brothers topped the country charts, showing his lasting relevance. He also collaborated again with Merle Haggard on Django and Jimmy, another chart-topping success. In the late 2010 S, Nelson was still releasing albums and receiving critical acclaim. In 2018, his song Cruel World was featured in the soundtrack for the video game Red Dead Redemption 2. That same year, Nelson participated in the tribute album Restoration, covering Elton John's Border Song. His 2019 release, Ride Me Back Home, earned him a Grammy Award for Best Country Solo Performance. When the U.S. faced pandemic lockdowns in 2020, Nelson adapted by live-streaming benefit concerts to support those financially impacted by the pandemic, continuing to use his platform to help others. By the early 2020s, Nelson was still creating music with new albums such as The Willie Nelson Family in 2021 and A Beautiful Time in 2022, earning multiple Grammy nominations and wins. His life and career were also the subject of a five-part documentary, Willie Nelson and Family, which premiered at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival. In 2023, Nelson celebrated his 90th birthday with two concerts at the Hollywood Bowl and was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, a major milestone in his storied career. In 2024, he contributed to Beyonce's Cowboy Carter album and after the passing of Chris Christopherson, became the last surviving member of The Highwaymen, solidifying his place as a legendary figure in music history. Personal Life 
Nelson has had quite a roller coaster ride in his personal and professional life, which is marked by four marriages and eight children. His first marriage to Martha Matthews, lasting from 1952 to 1962, was not only turbulent but also violent. They had three children together, Lana, Susie, and Willie, Billy Hugh Jr., the latter tragically passing away in 1991. One of the infamous incidents from this marriage includes Matthews sewing Nelson up in bedsheets and beating him with a broomstick. Following this chaotic chapter, Nelson married Shirley Colley in 1963, but their relationship came to an end in 1971 when Colley discovered that Nelson had a child with Connie Kepke. The couple had a daughter, Paula, before getting married the same year, and they went on to have another daughter, Amy. Nelson's third marriage lasted until 1988, and shortly afterward, in 1991, he married his current wife, Annie D'Angelo. They share two sons, Lucas and Jacob. Interestingly, in 2012, Nelson found out about another daughter, Renee Butts, whom he fathered with his friend Mary Haney in 1953. Renee passed away in 2017, but they shared a touching moment in 2016 when she posted a photo with him on Father's Day. Nelson has a fondness for wide open spaces, owning a ranch called Luck, Texas, located in Spicewood, and he spends part of his time in Maui, Hawaii. His time in Hawaii hasn't always been smooth sailing though, as back in 1981, while swimming, he had a lung collapse and had to be hospitalized. His love for smoking, first tobacco and later marijuana, has also impacted his health. He smoked up to three packs of cigarettes a day until he eventually switched to just marijuana after battling pneumonia multiple times. To minimize damage to his lungs, he began using a carbon-free system to consume marijuana in 2008. In addition to these challenges, Nelson's decades-long career of strumming the guitar left him with carpal tunnel syndrome, for which he had surgery in 2004. The surgery forced him to pause his tours and focus on songwriting. In more recent years, Nelson has faced health challenges, including breathing issues and COVID-19, but he has often managed to bounce back to resume touring. Nelson's life also includes a serious interest in martial arts, sparked during his childhood when he ordered self-defense manuals from Batman and Superman comic books. His formal martial arts journey began in the 1960s with Kung Fu and expanded in the 1980s to Taekwondo, in which he holds a second-degree black belt. He eventually added Gong Kwan Yu Sul to his repertoire and earned a fifth-degree black belt in 2014. His dedication to training is impressive, particularly given his lifestyle as a touring musician. He would train on his tour bus, sending videos to his martial arts master for feedback. The legal system hasn't been unfamiliar to Nelson either. His love of marijuana has landed him in trouble multiple times, starting in 1974, when he was first arrested for possession in Dallas. Another notable incident occurred in the Bahamas in 1977, where Nelson was jailed briefly for marijuana found in his luggage, but charges were later dropped. Throughout the years, he's had other run-ins with the law, such as in 2006 when he was caught with marijuana and hallucinogenic mushrooms. His most recent arrest came in 2010 in Sierra Blanca, Texas, where he was caught with six ounces of marijuana on his tour bus. Nelson managed to avoid a harsher sentence, thanks to a lenient prosecutor and an agreement to pay a fine. In addition to his legal troubles with marijuana, Nelson also had a well-publicized fight with the IRS in the 1990s. After poor financial advice and failed investments, he found himself owing a massive $32 million to the IRS. His lawyer negotiated the debt down to $16 million, and then eventually, Nelson settled for $6 million. To help pay off the debt, Nelson released a double album, The IRS Tapes, Who Will Buy My Memories? with all profits going directly to the IRS. He also sued the accounting firm responsible for his financial mismanagement and eventually cleared his debt by 1993. Despite all these ups and downs, Nelson's resilience and unique lifestyle have helped him remain a beloved figure in American music, and his story continues to capture the public's attention. Relationship with Chris Willie Nelson and Chris Christopherson share a deep, long-lasting bond that has evolved through decades of music, movies, and mutual respect. 
Their relationship dates back to the 1960s when both were still emerging artists in the world of country music, though Christofferson's path involved much more than music, being a Rhodes Scholar and a former Army helicopter pilot. They first crossed paths in the bustling Nashville scene, where Christofferson was working as a songwriter while Nelson had already made a name as a performer. One of their first significant professional connections occurred in the early 1970s, as both were finding their respective grooves in the outlaw country movement, a subgenre that broke away from Nashville's polished sound to embrace a more rebellious, gritty style. While Nelson had already started drifting toward the outlaw movement, Christofferson's songwriting success gave him further credibility with Nelson, who admired his song's rawness and poetic depth. Their relationship deepened when they worked together on the album The Highwayman in 1985. Alongside Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings, Christofferson and Nelson formed the country supergroup The Highwaymen. This collaboration wasn't just about making music, but represented a mutual admiration and camaraderie among legends who didn't quite fit into the traditional Nashville mold. The Highwaymen went on to become one of the most celebrated supergroups in country music, producing songs like Highwaymen, which encapsulated their rebellious spirit. Nelson and Christofferson, along with Cash and Jennings, toured and recorded as the Highwaymen, solidifying a relationship that transcended the usual professional boundaries. Outside of music, Nelson and Christofferson worked together in films. One notable collaboration was the 1984 movie Songwriter, in which Nelson and Christofferson starred together. The film focused on the struggles and triumphs of the music industry, playing to both their strengths as larger-than-life musical icons. Their natural chemistry on screen mirrored their friendship off-screen, and critics praised their performances. The movie showcased their deep understanding of each other as artists and highlighted their shared sense of humor and perspective on the world. Christofferson has always been vocal about his admiration for Nelson. He has described Nelson as one of the most important and influential figures in country music, praising his unique style and willingness to push boundaries. In interviews, Christofferson often mentions Nelson's kindness and humility, noting how he treats everyone the same, regardless of their status. Nelson, in turn, has often complimented Christofferson's songwriting, calling him a poet, and someone who brought a sense of literary depth to country music that had been lacking before. They continued to work together throughout the years, with Nelson covering Christofferson's songs and Christofferson participating in tributes to Nelson. They performed together numerous times, particularly in the Highwaymen's live shows, where their easy rapport and shared love of music shone through. One of the most heartfelt moments in their relationship occurred during Nelson's 70th birthday celebration in 2003. Christofferson, along with many other stars, performed in honor of Nelson, with Christofferson delivering one of the most emotional performances of the night. He spoke at length about what Nelson meant to him as both a friend and an artist, crediting him with being an enduring figure in his life. Nelson was visibly touched by Christofferson's words, further emphasizing the strength of their friendship. Their last significant collaboration came with the reformation of the Highwaymen in the mid-1990s for a brief tour and a final album. Even after the deaths of Jennings and Cash, Christofferson and Nelson maintained their close friendship. They continued to collaborate on occasional projects and appear at each other's performances, keeping the spirit of their bond alive. In later years, both men have continued to speak fondly of one another in interviews. Christofferson once said that Nelson had a way of making people feel special and important, a rare trait in the music business. Nelson has often echoed similar sentiments, noting that working with Christofferson has been one of the great privileges of his career. Chris Christofferson had a significant impact on Willie Nelson's son, Lucas, shaping his path as a musician with a few blunt yet meaningful words of advice. Their connection comes from a long-standing friendship between Christofferson and Willie, which naturally extended to Lucas as he grew up. Lucas was surrounded by music, frequently seeing Christofferson around the house and on the road with his dad. At a young age, Lucas shared a song he'd written, and Christofferson, ever the keen observer, heard it and told Lucas that he was destined to be a songwriter. Lucas wasn't entirely convinced at first, expressing his uncertainty, but Christofferson simply told him, you don't have a choice. 
This one statement carried profound weight, motivating Lucas to embrace his musical talents. Over the years, Lucas has found success in his own right, not just as Willie Nelson's son, but as a talented musician. He fronts his band, Lucas Nelson and Promise of the Real, and regularly tours, including stepping in for his father during the 2024 Outlaw Music Festival tour when Willie had to miss a few shows. Lucas's performances of his father's songs during that tour earned him significant praise, proving that he's not just following in his father's footsteps but carving his own path. Christofferson's influence didn't just push Lucas toward a music career, it also left an artistic mark on him. In 2022, Lucas paid tribute to Christofferson by covering his song, Help Me Make It Through the Night, delivering a rendition that showed his deep respect for the legendary songwriter. While Chris Christofferson officially retired from performing in 2021, with his final concert held in February 2020 at the Sunrise Theater in Florida, his legacy continues to influence both seasoned musicians like Willie Nelson and the next generation, like Lucas. Christofferson's straightforward wisdom paired with his years of groundbreaking work in the outlaw country made a lasting impression on Lucas. Whether or not Lucas would have pursued his musical career without that nudge from Christofferson is unknown, but what's clear is that his mentor's words helped him see his destiny more clearly. Christofferson's own career, marked by legendary songs and collaborations, is a testament to his place in country music history. His work with the Highwaymen, alongside Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and Johnny Cash, remains a cornerstone of the outlaw country movement. His retirement may have marked the end of his performances, but his influence continues to ripple through the music world, inspiring artists like Lucas Nelson to carry the torch. The deep connection between Willie Nelson and Chris Christofferson has not only shaped their own careers through friendship and collaboration, but also impacted the next generation, particularly Willie's son, Lucas Nelson. From their days together as part of the Highwaymen, Christofferson and Willie forged a bond that extended to their families. Christofferson's blunt wisdom to Lucas, pushing him towards songwriting, exemplifies the mentoring role he took in both personal and musical realms. Christofferson's influence, along with his legendary contributions to Outlaw Country, has left a lasting mark on the Nelson family, ensuring that his legacy lives on not only through his own songs, but through those of the next generation. Now retired, Christofferson remains a towering figure in country music history, while Lucas continues to carry forward the spirit of his father's and Chris's musical rebellion and artistry.